Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forums speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Jonathan Tobin, an editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, join us to discuss how should Israel respond to Poland's Holocaust revisionism. Mr. Tobin will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Jonathan Tobin. Thank you, Stacy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again, speaking on behalf of the Middle East Forum. And um, I've been asked today to discuss a very interesting question, um, one that provokes really the most sensitive feelings uh, among both Jews and Poles. And that is the question of how should Israel, and I would add the Jewish people as well, respond to historical revisionism about the Holocaust that has gone on in Poland. I um, can tell you that of all the issues that I write about, and for those of you who are readers of uh, JNS.org or my writings elsewhere, um, I write about a lot of controversial topics, but there are few that provoke such angry um, and really bitter feedback um, than this, and certainly any discussion of the Holocaust and this seeming conflict between uh, Jews and Israel and the Polish people. Um, it is in many ways a conflict and an argument that I think in a more rational world, we wouldn't be having. Um, it is um, 80 years later um, and whatever conflicts that existed and they certainly did between the Jews and the Poles, um, we're in a different era with a different situation. And yet we keep being drawn back to um, an old argument. And this latest um, chapter in uh, tension between Jews and Poles um, really starts with um, an article written in New York Magazine um, about um, historical revisionism in Poland. Um, some three years ago, Poland passed a law, the Republic of Poland passed a law that um, made it a crime to imply that either the Polish nation or Poland had in any way participated in the Holocaust. And in effect, this has had, um, as carried out and it has been uh, implemented um, to cause anyone, uh, certainly any historical writer who speaks of Polish complicity or the actions of individual Poles or in towns where either just before the Holocaust or during the Holocaust, during the German occupation of Poland or afterwards as uh, survivors try to return to their homes. And anybody who speaks of anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish violence among, the, among Poles, it can, it can be liable to be prosecuted or anybody who writes about it. And recently um, there was a case of two historians who wrote about um, a particular person who was the mayor of a small town in Poland who had been thought of as someone who would help the Jews. They alleged that he had in fact um, betrayed a group of Jews to the Germans who wound up murdering them. And this prompted a lawsuit and um, a bitter go around between historians and the Polish government. Now, why, is Pol why did Poland do that? And why have Jews been drawn into this argument? Well, Poland did it in part for understandable reasons. Um, many people who have spoken about the Holocaust speak of Polish complicity, speak of Auschwitz, the Nazi death camp, the main, the largest Nazi death camp as a Polish death camp or a Polish concentration camp. And of course it was located in Poland, but it wasn't, built or organized by the Poles. It was organized by the German Nazis. Um, Poland is innocent of the crime of Auschwitz. It is innocent of the mass murder of Jews, the systematic mass murder of, you know, of European Jewry um, that, you know, um, that was carried out by the Nazis, not by Poland. Now, of course, the context is that Poland, uh, if you had asked anybody in the 1930s or before, which is, what is the most anti-Semitic country in 
in Europe, well, there might have been some debate between France and Poland, but Poland would probably have won. There was really official anti-Semitism in the independent Republic of Poland um, that existed between the two world wars. It was widespread. It was deeply embedded in the political culture and also unfortunately in the religious culture as the Catholic church at that time was still um, very, very stuck in a really an ancient mindset of hatred towards the Jews, which was widely shared. Um, anybody who's, who, who knew their grandparents or great grandparents who, who emigrated from parts of Poland, and I speak as someone whose grandparents grew up in the parts of Poland actually that were part of the Austro-Hungarian empire, but understood what the culture of um, what is now Poland um, knows that there was tremendous anti-Semitism and even official, as I said, during the, pre during the interwar period. But Poland also was a country that suffered, suffered as much if not more than any other during the Second World War. Um, some 90% of the Jews of Poland were murdered by the Nazi. Some nearly three, uh, you know, um, nearly three million were, were murdered there, almost half of the number who were killed in the Holocaust. But the Poles lost one out of 10 of their number of the non-Jewish citizens of Poland. Um, that's a higher percentage than any place maybe other than Russia. And Poland thinks of itself as the Christ of nations as for the last 250 years, it has been crushed by the attentions of the great powers between Russia and Germany and Austria, um, lost its independence, um, struggled vainly to regain it and um, had, an, had a legacy of heroism of fighting against foreign occupiers. And in the case of the Germans, the Poles were not officially um, collaborators, the Polish nation, certainly, and the, certainly the Polish Republic the Pol uh, as a government. There was no puppet government of Poland. Um, the Polish resistance, unlike in many other countries, was real. It wasn't um, PR and it fought diligently and courageously. Um, but of course it did not save the Jews. Uh, we know that the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto were essentially alone. They were not aided by the Polish Home Army resistance. Um, of course, there wasn't much that the Polish Home Army could have done. And indeed, even a year and change after the Warsaw Ghetto was leveled, Warsaw itself rose up, um, non-Jewish Warsaw, what was left of Warsaw rose up to fight the Germans in a revolt uh, that they hoped to save their independence before the, the Soviet uh, Red Army rolled in, but the Soviets held back, let the Germans crush the rebellion and Warsaw was leveled. Um, Polish casualties were enormous. Poles have good reason to be proud of that resistance, good reason to mourn their dead, just as Jews mourn ours. Um, so, you have this situation, I mean, where Jews still think of the Poles as they were 80 years ago. And um, famously, former uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir said of the Poles, and he was someone who had grown up in pre-war uh, pre Poland and whose family had been killed by Polish collaborators. Um, the Poles sucked anti-Semitism with their mother's milk. Well, that was a specific context. And to relive, to sort of re-up that conflict now is a question of what are Jewish priorities? Who are the enemies of, of Israel and of the Jewish people now? Do we still, con should we still consider the Poles that way? Well, there's good reason to think not. Um, Poland, um, like other Eastern European countries, is not, uh, has not been sucked into the vortex of uh, 21st century anti-Semitism, which is based in anti-Zionism, uh, um, a weird alliance of Islamists and uh, Western liberal elites. Um, it is friendly with Israel. It has tried to cultivate a good supportive relationship with Israel, very much in contrast to that of Western European nations. Its current government is right wing. It is accused of authoritarianism. 
that may be overstated, but it is certainly very nationalist. And that's what leads them into what I can, what I think objectively has to be considered some hypersensitivity about the Holocaust issue. Now, as I said, they have good reason to complain when someone like President Barack Obama called Auschwitz a Polish death count. That was a terrible mistake and it's really a libel against the Poles. But at the same time, for the Polish government to pretend that there was no collaboration by individual Poles, that there were no instances of anti-Jewish violence by ordinary Polish citizens, both during the, during the German occupation and after it, is equally absurd and it's myopic. And it does them no good, it's hurt their reputation. But the question is, how should Israel, how should the Jewish people respond to it? Well, I think the first thing one has to say is that you can't accept lies. Uh, you can't accept the, you know, the fiction that all Poles you know, help Jews. Um, there, are more, there were more righteous Gentiles, uh, certainly among those honored at Yad Vashem in Israel, uh, in Poland than in, in any other country. Of course, they had more opportunity. There were more Jews there. Uh, there was more slaughter there. Many, many Jews, many, many Poles, non-Jewish Poles were righteous Gentiles. But there were also many who were not, as was the case in the rest of Europe. That can't, it shouldn't be denied. And yet Jews should also recognize that unlike in say France, the Polish police weren't rounding up uh, the, Jews for the, Germ uh, the Jews for the Germans. They were themselves being rounded up in many instances. There should be some commonality. Now, after all these years, maybe it's time for some commonality of suffering. It's time for the Poles to own up about their history Yes, they were heroic. Yes, they suffered. Yes, there were Poles who were still stuck in that same sick mindset of, of hatred of their fellow, of their Jewish um, compatriots. And yes, Jews who, for our own very good reason, think only of how we suffered. And it's true, if you were a Jew in Poland, you were marked for death. Um, and more than 90% did die. That's not the case with the Poles, 90% survived, but one out of 10 is, you know, the Poles were literally decimated. It's time for Jews to recognize Polish suffering and Polish heroism itself. Is that possible? Well, I can tell you by some of the reactions to um, a column I wrote about this two weeks ago, uh, prior to Yom HaShoah and talking about this controversy, I'm not so sure. Um, Poles are very angry about uh, magazine articles and allegations about their anti-Semitism and about their history. Um, but they're also, to, you know, they're also some of the responses um, to what I wrote about what happened were bitter, angry, bordering on anti-Semitic. Some of the Jewish responses were equally angry and repeating that uh, theme from Shamir about Poles being inveterately, uh, in, you know, irredeemably anti-Semitic. But I would like to end by pointing something out to both peoples, and certainly to Jews. The Jewish people today, the state of Israel today, has real enemies, real people who are trying to complete the work of Hitler. Uh, the regime in Iran, which is trying to get a nuclear weapon and has, which would have no other purpose than to threaten or to eliminate Israel, which their leaders continue to claim is their goal. Um, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamist terrorist organizations, they too have as their goal the elimination of the state of Israel. Even the moderates of Fatah among the, uh, Fatah among the Palestinians still have not have yet to recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state, no matter where its borders are drawn. Israel and the Jewish people have real enemies and real enemies not only in the Middle East, but anti-Semites, whether from the far right or the far left, the anti-Zionist far left, which is loud and influential in some ways more influ far more influential than the violent uh, white supremacist anti-Semitic right. These are real enemies. They're enemies right now. To focus instead on the battles of a war that's long over, of a political and social and religious conflict is, that is long over is I think a terrible mistake and a misallocation.
allocation of priorities and energy and emotion. And I would say that for the polls, um, for them to focus on anger about discussions of their history, uh, Polish history has great, many great things for them to be proud of. It has some things not to be proud of, as, as is the case with any people. It's time for us all to put aside this argument, to accept each other's flaws and to accept each other's suffering and heroism. And if we do, I think we'll find that Israel and Poland, the Jewish people and the Polish people right now have a lot more in common than they have that separates us. That should be the way it goes forward. I fear, however, that the pull of history and hate and suffering and bitterness, justified bitterness over past slights, over past hurts, seems right now to be much stronger. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much. So our first question is, what concrete ways has this issue affected Poland and Israel relations? Well, I think it's, it's created a number of diplomatic incidents, uh, most memorably two years ago, when um, Prime Minister Netanyahu was attempting to have talks uh, and a meeting with um, the Polish uh, government, which was eager to have good relations, still is eager to have good relations with Israel. Um, the issue of the law came up and uh, Netanyahu was kind of put in an almost impossible situation where he could not, you know, he could not claim that the uh, revisionist uh, historical law that they've been trying to enforce is a good thing. It's, it's based on a lie. Um, so he tried to fudge it. And of course, you know, the middle of the road is where there is roadkill. And he took it from both sides. He took it from angry Jews. He took it from angry Poles. Um, and I think it's created more. His foreign minister, uh, Yisrael Katz, who's still an important person in the Israeli government in the Likud, he quoted Shamir's uh, mother's milk of anti-Semitism. And, um, you know, that started things all over again. And again, it, can, it's, it's clearly, and I think Prime Minister Netanyahu knows this, and he's tried to implement it. Poland, like Hungary, like some of the other Eastern European countries, um, whatever their flaws, and a lot of people uh, focus heavily on um, the anti-democratic or certainly authoritarian nature of some of their leaders and, and ruling parties, but these are countries that want to be friends with Israel. They're not there to criticize and to nitpick or to aid um, Islamists or, or Palestinian groups looking to destroy Israel. It's in Israel's interest to, to be friends with Poland. It's in Poland's interest to be friends with Israel. But this issue, um, based on a foolish law and anger over things that happened that are still painful to us. We, we haven't forgotten them. And they haven't forgotten their pain. And it's, it's throwing a monkey wrench into um, what should be a very necessary and productive diplomatic relationship. Thank you. So what programs or anything do you suggest to meld the Polish-Jewish cooperation in light of that? Well, I think um, until this law was passed, I think there were lots of ways in which Jews and Poles were starting to interact. There were, there was, you know, major efforts by Poland to people to come to Israel, to know Israel. Um, they were doing their best to attract Jewish tourism to Poland, which has so many historical Jew, uh, Jewish sites. Um, you know, Poland in some ways still has the legacy of its, its pre-war culture of anti-Semitism that was actually nurtured under the under communist rule, because you know Soviet Union was profoundly anti-Semitic, um, but it was in some ways it was trying to come out of it. And indeed, I think programs like the March for the Living, which I cited in one of my articles, um, which is a program, unfortunately, it has gone the, the last two years, a program of high school students from Israel, the United States, around the world, who visit Auschwitz, who go to Poland. And then come to Israel. I mean, it's it's a you know bringing history full circle, but it enables them to see Poland as not just a, a, a cartoon out of history or just a symbol of hate and, and anti-Semitism. You know, they, they were seeing it in a way that say my grandparents who had grown up being afraid of their non-Jewish neighbors um, could could was were not ever able to see Poland. 
I think these kinds of things, the more interaction, um, the more we'll see that this conflict, as I said, uh, certainly Jews have, have real fights now and real enemies. Uh, the Poles are not, is, you know, are not Israel's enemy. They're not the Jewish people's enemy. Understood, thank you. But do you think that the 2018 Polish law has in fact had the unintended effect of shining a light on an underbelly of popular Polish anti-Semitism today? Oh, I think there's no question about it. I, I've seen it myself in some of the reactions. Um, you know, Jewish readers tend to think I'm too sympathetic to the Poles because I've tried to sort of shine a light on both ends of this. The Poles, many, most of the poll, the reactions I get from people in Poland, um, even though some of my articles are actually regularly translated into Polish, I can't, I don't read Polish myself, so I can't tell how accurate the translation is. Um, they're very angry at anything that alludes to an unhappy past. And I think this does, you know, it shows Poland isn't quite past its history of anti-Semitism. And many Jews, even those, unlike Yitzhak Shamir, who did not grow up there, you know, 100 years ago, but um, have held on to it, are only too ready to see uh, the Poland of 2021 as if it's the Poland of 1939 or even 1942 or 43. Thank you. Along those lines, is there a Jewish presence in Poland today, and what are their numbers and status? Um, there is a Jewish presence. It is relatively small. Most of the Jewish population of Poland that had sort of returned after the Holocaust um, left in, in various stages of um, communist purges in the 60s and then afterwards in the 70s. There is some, I, I, I'm not going to pull an inaccurate number off the top of my head. There is, you know, there are small Jewish communities. There are Chabad's, of course. <laughs> in places like Warsaw and Krakow and other places. Um, it's not like in Germany where there is a very large and in some ways thriving Jewish community, despite some of the problems there, and as well as the, you know, sort of the disconnect that I think certainly people of uh, previous generations would feel about Jews living in Germany. There isn't that same level of thriving Jewish community, but it exists. Um, and uh, I think the chief rabbi of Poland is an American Jew who, who uh, works there. We, uh, at JNS, we did a really interesting feature on him a couple of years ago. And um, so there is a Jewish community. Um, I think most of them, like the Jews of Hungary, for example, are quick to point out that the government of Poland, which is so vilified in the United States, and to some extent now in Israel, has actually been somewhat protective of them and is not hostile. But um, even though there is this still very strong undercurrent of, of anti-Semitism, which is pretty understandable considering how strong it was within the lifetimes of people who are still around now. Thank you. And do you believe that Israel is sufficiently acknowledging the suffering of the Polish people in order for their government to soften its stance or is there more that they can be doing? I think there's more that both governments could do. I, you know, it's, you know, when, when I discuss this issue with Jews, they say like, we don't want to talk about Polish suffering. You know, when we think of Poland in the 1940s, we're talking about 3 million Jews out of the 6 million of the Holocaust dying in Poland. The, the chances of Jews, of a Jewish sur Jew surviving in Poland was far less than almost anywhere else in Europe. Um, I think there is a reluctance on the part of our community to, acknowledge Polish suffering, there, there's actually a lot of ignorance, I think, among Jews who know a lot, know our history, you know, know what happened from our frame of reference, but really don't, under, don't know um, what the situation was for Poles. I'd like, I'd like to also point out that in my mind, one of the greatest heroes of the, of, um, of the Holocaust was a Polish non-Jew, Jan Karski, who was smuggled in, a, a, home, a resistance officer who um, took the news of the Holocaust at great risk to himself, um, finding out, visiting camps and the situation in ghettos, and then going to the West to tell British and American leaders, including Franklin Roosevelt himself, about what was going on, and even American Jewish leaders like Justice Felix Frankfurter, um, and 
being not and not being believed. I mean, uh, of all the people that I interviewed in the course of my career, and you say, who is the coolest person you, you ever talked to? When I interviewed Jan Karski, I mean, that was, you know, I still get chills thinking about what he did. So we, yes, we have to do more. The polls have to do more to educate their own government and to not rise up. Unfortunately, this, this Polish government, which is, you know, nationalist, there's nothing wrong about the, them being nationalists. I don't believe there's something wrong in being a nationalist, but when that um, leads to sort of denial of history, revisionist history, and sort of feeding this kind of resentment, yes, they're still out to get us. And Poles, you know, Poles and Jews are both paranoid. And as, you know, Henry Kissinger famous said, just because people, you know, just because they're not out to get you, it doesn't mean you're not, just because they are out to get you doesn't mean you can't be paranoid. Uh, I think Jews and Poles, Jews are paranoid, understandably about anti-Semitism. Poles are paranoid about what they've suffered. Um, we both need to recognize this. So this is obviously a completely different scenario, but if Germany were to pass a law like this, I, I assume the reaction would be much different, stronger. It's an interesting question. It's sort of an interesting counterfactual, um, but it's almost, not, it's almost certain not to happen because the whole identity of post-war Germany, certainly post-war West Germany, which has now become the entire, you know, Bundesrepublik, the Federal Republic of Germany, is acknowledgement of what they did. They had to do it to rejoin the, 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 the community of nations. Now we can say rightly that there are many German anti-Semites, there are many Germans who deny history. They're, they're, you know, they, have, they have still plenty of bad apples. It's, you know, if there's any country where there's still resonance of history, it's there, but officially, I mean, you, you can't, it, it's, just, it's just forbidden. A poll, Poland, which, you know, was reconstituted after the Soviet occupation ended as an independent country, didn't have to go through that period of acknowledging any faults. And indeed, they came into existence, you know, fiercely holding on to their victim status. And they had right to be considering themselves victims, um, even if they were not victimized in the same way as Jews. So it, it, it's kind of a you know, yeah, that would be Jews, you know, everybody's head would explode and their hair would be on fire, but it would be, it's almost impossible for that, that to happen. Um, just the way Germany is set up and its laws, the way its laws are set up, it's the opposite there. Well, thank you so much for answering that. Uh, why do you believe that the roles of Eastern and Western Europe have changed their positions concerning Jews and anti-Semitism? Well, um, I'm not sure that they've actually flipped so much. Um, there was plenty of anti-Semitism in Western Europe before the Holocaust. Uh, France, um, you know, the, the country of the Dreyfus case um, had a tremendously virulent history of anti-Semitism, um, which played out in plain view during the Holocaust as the French collaborated, you know, you know de Gaulle created this myth um, that all because he had resisted bravely and consistently um, that all Frenchmen did. And, and that was always a lie. Um, most did not, most just went along like ordinary people do anywhere. They, you know, and, um, but the complicity of the Vichy government of the French police was, was enormous. Um, there's a, there was anti-Semitism in Britain. I mean, people like Winston Churchill was, were the exceptions. Um, of course, Britain was a free country. It never went through what happened in, in these other places. Um, it's not that surprising that anti-Semitism has recurred in Western Europe. I mean, it's part of their tradition too. What's interesting about Eastern Europe is that, the, is that these nations, places like Hungary and Poland, um, see themselves against, still against Russia and still very suspicious of Western Europe and suspicious of mass immigration from the Middle East, which has you know, altered the politics of, of France for, you know, and, and Sweden and some of these other countries, they see that as a threat to their national identity. And therefore um, what, has, what goes on in the streets of Western European cities where Jews are at risk if they are identifiably Jewish, it doesn't happen in the same way. Um, not saying there's not anti-Semitism in Poland or Hungary, I'm sure there, there's plenty but not in the same virulent open way. Um, and their governments are not as, uh, shall we say, uh, queasy about it.
Thank you. And uh, we have one last question that came in three different different ways. Um, do you think that religion in Poland is the basis of the anti-Semitism or what role does that play? Well, um, it's a difficult question to answer about 2021. Religion played a huge role in anti-Semitism, um, the anti-Semitism of pre-war Poland. Um, unfortunately, as I said, the Catholic Church of that time was virulently anti-Semitic and in, you know, in encouraging anti-Semitism. Um, but let's also recognize something else. I mean, I know everybody just wants to keep refighting these wars, but you know, the example of Pope John Paul II, you know, the Polish Pope, was a person who had Jewish friends where he grew up um, and who defended the Jewish people, who helped recognize Israel, who did so much to guide the modern Catholic Church, the Catholic Church of today, from a position of really almost official anti-Semitism to a very different place in which official anti-Semitism is forbidden by the church. Um, the church is openly opposed to anti-Semitism. It's not 100% where we would like them to be about Israel in many respects, but it's, it's 180 degrees from where it was 100 years ago. And we have to recognize that that strain exists within Poland and uh, be willing to meet people who say want to be our friends, speaking as the Jews, uh, rather than just hold on to the, yes, they're irredeemably anti-Semitic. Nobody is irredeemably anything. And I think, you know, I, I have hope. I believe that the Jewish and Polish peoples don't have to be enemies forever. Um, there are good reasons to be angry about what happened um, and to not allow people to cover it up. You know, lies about the Holocaust are unacceptable under any circumstance, but that doesn't have to mandate today's feelings, today's policies, or certainly the relations between the modern state of Israel and the current Republic, uh, free Republic of Poland. Wonderful, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Can you remind our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Well, you can read me every day in J at JNS.org, the Jewish News Syndicate. I write a daily column as well as we produce fresh material about Israel, the Middle East, and American Jewish life, the Jewish world in general. Um, we're a daily, so log on every day to see it. Sign up to get our newsletter. And uh, yes, you can read me elsewhere too, but read JNS. And thanks very much for having me on. All right. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. For our viewers and listeners, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.